Hey friends, Pastor Chris here with today's gold nugget from God's Word. Today we're looking at the topic of trust God's timing. To trust in God's timing. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 24. I have loved preparing for this lesson. There's so many things in here that uh, I would like to unfold for you and let you um, learn some things. And, and so if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 24, verse 32 and 33 is where we'll start off. And here's what it says. Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near at the door. So the very first thing we have here is, is this fig tree and we want to ask our question well, what's the fig tree all about the fig tree uh let me and th this was something that I, I thought was really interesting when i dug a little deeper and, and did some study on this uh, the olive tree is a symbol of israel but the fig tree is a symbol of the nations now the altar can never accept a piece of olive wood onto it you can never burn olive wood on the altar. The preferred fuel on the altar was the fig tree. The poor man's offering was to bring a branch of the fig tree to be used as fuel for the pyre. And so that was their offering. The fig tree is a, it has several characteristics. It was a great shade, shade tree. It grows quickly. Uh, it has big leaves. If you remember back in Genesis, Adam and Eve, they used leaves from a fig tree to cover themselves. Um, however, uh, many scholars will say that it, they don't cover too well. Uh, but a fig leaf is symbolic in the Hebrew language as excuses. Um, that, that was just something that in their their language a fig leaf was symbolic of making excuses now, there are two seasons of fruit uh, with the fig tree in the spring it produces small fruit around march and april and that's considered the poor man's fruit but then in the fall around october and november it would produce very sweet fruit, and it was known as the rich man's fruit. Jesus, in the springtime, looks at the fig tree that should have the small poor man's fruit on it. If you remember that scripture, there was no fruit on it, so he cursed it. And that was symbolic, then, of judgment being on the nations who don't bear fruit to God. They are destroyed. No fruit, why have them? So those limbs of the fig tree burned on the altar. What was left there was just the stalk. All the limbs dried, they withered, the, the tree died, they fell. And so all you have left there is just the trunk of that tree. Now there are many scholars that believe that that very trunk, which was along the way, that that very trunk, of that tree was used to crucify Christ on that. Um, the fig tree was along the way, like I said. Uh, in Matthew 24, which our scripture points to today, gives us this. Let's read it one more time. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near. So that secondary fruit's what we're reading about here because it's the summertime where there should have been the, the poor man's fruit on it, but it's saying as soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves. See, that's already happened. The poor man's fruit in that season has just come to an end. Now it's sprouting leaves. Because summer's here, and it was in that time of getting prepared for, for that season 
when it is going to produce the rich man's fruit later in the fall. And so the Lord uses that in this scripture to give us a picture of his coming, uh, to be prepared, to be seeing the signs and all those things taking place. Uh, and so he's given us that understanding that when we see these things taking place in the summer, that in the fall is when uh, the the rich man's fruit will be available. Um, James chapter 5 verse 9 teaches us that the judge is standing at the door. The Lord is, he is ready to walk through that door when that time comes and judgment's taken place on you know, the, the poor man and his offering, uh, the judgment of the nations as being taken on those fig trees and, and those branches that have been torn off and burned there at the altar. But then the rich man's fruit is coming and to realize that that's, in the fall. And so in the summertime, he's saying, be looking, be prepared to see that. He goes on and says in verse number 34 and 35, truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, the Lord's giving us other things. He's saying, <clears throat> Heaven and earth will pass away. What heaven and earth is he talking about? Well, the earth is pretty sim simple. We know the earth because we live on it right now. But what heaven is he talking about? When we see the word heaven in the Bible, I think our minds immediately go to that celestial heaven, that eternal resting place for you and I to be in the presence of God when we die and, and we live there with the Lord in that place called heaven. That phrase, or the, the Greek word for it, is eporaneus. Uh, and it's talking above the sky. It's the celestial heaven. The heaven that's talking about here is that oranus. That's the, the Greek word there. And it means the vaulted expanse of the sky with all things visible in it. You know, when I look up at the sky and I see that, that is a what they called heaven as well because it was that expanse. I look up and I can see the stars. I can see the sun. I can see the moon. I can see all those things that are in that place. But here he's saying that heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Then finally, he goes over to the, the last set of verses here in verses 36 through 30. Through 41, he said, Now concerning that day and that hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. That means that Jesus himself doesn't know when he's returning. Only God the Father knows that information. And someday he will share that and Jesus Christ will come back. It says in verse 37, As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They did not know. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding grain with the hand mill. One will be taken and one will be left. So they did not know. They were buried in sensual living. I, I want to give you a couple of scriptures. Romans chapter 1 verse 24 says this, Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. And then James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. 
You fight and you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns je jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. <clears throat> in the spirit within us, uh, it becomes selfish, that, that human spirit, that, that side of us that's not of God, it becomes more selfish as we go through life. And life becomes more worldly. Hope becomes more materialistic. Death becomes more final. Uh, the conscious becomes dull, hard, and sensitive to, to the right things. And our will craves for more and more. That's the worldly part of things. And that's what he's saying here. That it, as in the days of Noah, there these people had this man Noah building this ark, which was a, a way for them to escape. But they mocked and they were turning to their own sensual pleasures and making fun of Noah until that day when that first raindrop fell and then more and more rain. The people, it would seem, would be amazed at seeing all those animals loading into the ark and realizing, see, they had some signs right before them, and Noah telling them, you know, the coming of the Lord is it's going to happen. His judgment's going to fall, come into the ark, and no one would do it. They just laughed and mocked, and folks, it's that way in the world right now. Uh, Christians are being mocked and laughed at because of our belief, our faith in the Lord, but there's going to come a day when God's judgment's going to fall, and those people, their laughter is going to turn to mourning. Uh, what a sad day that's going to be. It says in verse 39, 39, they didn't know. They didn't expect coming ju judgment. They felt secure in themselves and in their world. Uh, they were living worldly, materialistic lives, eating and drinking when they should have been sensible and clear-minded. Their concern was... Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. You can find that in Isaiah chapter 22, verse number 13. The Lord said all of that. Uh, Isaiah 22, 13 says, But instead of joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating meat and drinking wine, they said, Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we will die. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We need to just understand that Christ's return is going to shatter the world of the person. Those who eat and drink, those who um, those who eat and eat and eat, and those who drink and drink and drink, those who marry and then they get married again, those who know not, those who do not believe, those who are close-minded, mind, close minded, those who are arrogant. Oh my goodness, we're around them every single day. One final scripture. Titus 2.13 says, The true believer is ever looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, in the day of Noah, People were caught, they thought, unaware, but it wasn't unaware. They had been warned. They were given opportunity, but they were so caught up in themselves and the ways of the world that they didn't receive it. And because of that, judgment fell on them that was eternal. If I can encourage anybody that's listening to me today to just realize what this message is trying to teach us, that we are to be a people that is seeking Jesus. Remember the title of the study today, I'm trying to get back to it, is to trust 
God's timing. His timing is perfect. And his return will be at a perfect time. But not only just his return, but in our everyday lives. Realize that God's timing is perfect. We have this mentality within ourselves, if I want it, and I want it now. But folks, if we will just surrender our lives to God's timing and live our lives that way, then I promise you everything's going to work out for your good and for God's glory. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that, Lord, we would all live that way, trusting your timing, Lord, being prepared and looking for the signs of your return, Lord, to, to understand, Father, what the fig tree symbolized, Father, and that uh, your return is a picture of uh, that fig tree that, God, you cursed. And, and then later on, we see this, this same fig tree, Father, or a, a similar fig tree, Lord, that is, is used as a picture, Father, of, of you saying that when we look in the summertime, and we see the leaves budding to realize that your return is close. So, Father, we look forward to that time. God, I pray each and every person will be in church on Sunday, Lord, and they will surrender their lives to you in all aspects. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name I pray. Amen. Have a great rest of your day. God bless you.